Before starting today's video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video to encourage us to provide the best. In the 60s, my neighbor's parents moved from India to the UK. They developed a habit of visiting their home country every year to see loved ones, spending half their time there and half in the UK. When I was 15, they invited my family to join them on one of their trips. At the time, I thought I was a cool rock prince with long blonde hair and red kerrang, but my curly hair ruined that look, and now I look like a cherub. My neighbor's dad planned the holiday meticulously, handing each of us a brown folder with our itinerary, hotel brochures, money conversion charts, train timetables, four passport photos for forms, and a list of useful contacts. I felt like James Bond, except for the moments when people mistook me for a girl, like when one of my neighbor's relatives offered to fit me for a sari. Despite these incidents, I enjoyed the trip until we arrived at a large hotel in the middle of the jungle, miles from anywhere. As we pulled up, we noticed that the hotel was under new management, and only one light was on five stories up. A group of men huddled around a fire, and one started to shout before being silenced with a slap from the guy next to him. As our driver waited, one of the group strolled over and signaled for the window to be lowered. The man on the other side could be described as an Indian drug lord in the style of Alfred Hitchcock. He greeted us with a grin that could only be described as a poo-eating grin as he peered into the back seat and checked our reservations before leading us into the deserted lobby. It wasn't simply that the staff had gone to bed. It was as though whoever had been there had left in a hurry, as evidenced by the toppled chairs. Despite it being 9 p.m., Hitchcock informed us that our rooms weren't ready and invited us to wait in the dining room, which was empty except for a nine-year-old boy who took our order before disappearing. An hour later, our food arrived on mismatched plates, and we were all unnerved by the strange circumstances. However, we were in a large group, and everyone had spoken Hindi and Kakani, so we felt we could handle anything unusual. Hitchcock eventually led us to our rooms, which were stripped bare except for the beds and bedside tables. The walls had exposed wires where one might expect to find a TV or phone, and rectangular patches of discolored wallpaper indicated a rebellion against terrible hotel art. The only decoration in the room is a small metal horse on one of the bedside tables. I share the room with my younger brother and insist on taking the bed closest to the door, thinking I could summon Thor if necessary. Hitchcock lingers in the doorway for a while, flashing his teeth and giving me a creepy look. I close the door on him, and my brother and I chat until we fall asleep. I wake up in the pitch black darkness, not knowing what time it is, and hear the door to my room click shut. I panic, thinking I'm not a Viking rock prince, but a flying baby who plays the harp. I hide under the blankets until my heart stops racing then stealthily roll out of bed to check the door. It's unlocked. I barricade it with the bedside table, check on my brother, and go back to sleep. In the morning, we all want to leave as soon as possible. Our neighbor's dad complains to Hitchcock and gets half of our money back. Outside, we notice the charred remains of a hotel bed in the fire pit. Our driver, who had a room in the hotel, slept in the bus because he didn't want any funny business. Throughout the night, people were constantly coming and going. At one point, he woke up to see a man's nose pressed against the window, staring in at him. The driver scared the man off with a hit to the window, causing him to scamper away into the jungle like Mowgli. We gave the driver a generous tip, and as we were leaving, Hitchcock waved to us from the lobby while adjusting his crotch. We thought the strangeness was over, but about an hour into our journey, I decided to check our itinerary. My heart sank as I pulled out my spy folder and noticed that one of my passport photos was missing. A perfect rectangle measuring 35 by 45 millimeters had been removed from the corner. Three little Viking rock cherubs stared up at me, mourning their fallen brother. I searched through the folder and asked my parents if they had taken it for some reason, but was starting to lose my cool as everything from the previous night came flooding back. 
I explained what had happened, and a strange moment of silence followed as everyone looked at each other. As it turned out, everyone had heard someone outside their door at some point during the night, but had bolted their doors before going to sleep. My brother and I had no deadbolt, and Hitchcock had intentionally put us in that room. The driver suggested that we return to the hotel and demand compensation, and we gave him plenty of tips as we arrived back at the padlock doors. Hitchcock and his cronies had disappeared, and to top it all off, the little metal horse that had been on our bedside table was now on the step in front of the door. I took it as a free souvenir, feeling satisfied that we had given Hitchcock the middle finger. A girl messaged me on a dating site, but she wasn't my type. She asked me to come to her hotel room because she found me attractive. I wasn't interested, but I messaged her back and suggested we chat instead. However, she persisted and said she was on vacation at a hotel near my house. I declined, and when I asked why she chose to vacation here, she said she was from the same city but wanted to smash with me. I found it suspicious that she would rent a hotel room in her own city and blocked her. She created a second account and sent me a link to a naked woman's photo to convince me. So I blocked her again. Not even 15 minutes later, she messaged me from another account. I suspected that my friends were pranking me, so I decided to confront the girl. I created a new kick account and told her to go on video, claiming that I would catch my friends. However, it turned out to be her, and she started doing inappropriate things to persuade me. I deleted the kick account and my dating account, feeling unsettled. Two months later, I reactivated my account and received a message from her claiming she saw me riding my bike downtown weeks ago and described my outfit. I had enough, so I warned her that I could involve the police for harassment, even though I wasn't sure if I had a strong case. It worked, and I never heard from her again. I was grateful that I used my head instead of my attraction. My girlfriend and I stayed at a motel for two nights. It wasn't the best place, and it was located in a rough neighborhood, but we opted for it since it was cheap. At that time, I was 20 and my girlfriend was 19. The first night was uneventful, but the second night was strange. Around midnight, we heard banging on our door. I peeked through the peephole and saw a scruffy-looking, shirtless white man with jeans. I assumed he might be under the influence of drugs and was randomly knocking on doors. I decided to ignore it and went back to bed. However, around 2 a.m., I heard the man say something outside. He threatened that my girlfriend and I were going to die tonight. I tried to convince myself that I didn't hear it, but I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. I wondered how he knew about us and if he had been observing us. I didn't want to disturb my girlfriend, Jane, who was asleep, but my nerves got the better of me, and I woke her up quietly. She thought I was being paranoid, but the man began knocking on our door again, causing us to panic. We cautiously looked through the peephole and saw him standing outside our door, facing the opposite direction with his hands behind his back in a military-like posture. I picked up the phone in the motel room and called the police even though Jane thought I was overreacting. I was too frightened not to call. I informed the police about the man and was assured that they would dispatch someone to our location. I also contacted the lobby, but they were unable to assist and advised me to call the police. 10 minutes later, a police car arrived, which was a decent response time. However, they left without finding the man. The man continued to spout more nonsensical threats outside our door. He taunted me, calling me a baby for calling the police and threatened to beat me to death. He stopped talking briefly, but we heard him again after 10 to 15 minutes, saying that Jane and I would die that night. Jane heard him this time, and she became equally frightened as I was. She suggested that we call the police again, and I let her speak to them since she was more shaken up than I was. She conveyed a sense of urgency that I wasn't capable of. Once again, a police cruiser arrived in the parking lot, and I watched as it was about to leave, frustrated and angry. Feeling slightly safer with the police nearby, 
I stepped outside to approach the cruiser. I inquired why they were leaving, and the officers informed me that they had talked to the man but couldn't do anything since he wasn't committing any obvious crimes. They even suggested that he was just tampering with the air conditioner in our room. I explained to them about the threats he had made towards us, but they repeated that there was nothing they could do. Frustrated, the police left once again, leaving my girlfriend and me alone at the motel with the unpredictable man. He seemed angrier now, possibly because he saw me speaking with the police. He knocked on our door again and called me a baby while threatening to kill me. So, for the third time, I called the police. After about 15 minutes, I heard the sound of handcuffs outside our room, and I felt an immense sense of relief. Although I don't know what caused the police to finally decide to arrest him, I was grateful that they did. As they cuffed him, he kept saying, what did I do? I didn't do anything. As soon as the police left, my girlfriend and I checked out of the motel and headed to a friend's house to spend the night. As we were pulling out of the motel parking lot, I saw the man in the back of the police car, and his eyes were the most lifeless and soulless I had ever seen. When I was 14, an incident occurred that still gives me chills to this day. Now at 22 years old, the memory is as vivid as ever. It's terrifying to think about what might have happened if things had gone differently. It was summer break and I convinced my mom to let me visit my grandparents in Russia for a couple of months. We had moved to North America when I was young, and I hadn't been back to Russia much since. I was excited for my first solo trip abroad, and my grandparents were thrilled to have me. They even planned a vacation for us to a popular beach resort in Turkey a month after my arrival. We would be staying in a luxurious five-star resort in Ankara for two weeks. I was ecstatic at the prospect of visiting two countries in one summer, especially such an exotic place as Turkey. However, upon arrival in Russia, I realized my grandparents were very protective and wouldn't let me go anywhere alone. I spent most of my days bored in my room playing my PSP. I was also accustomed to being active and wanted to go jogging, but my grandparents wouldn't allow me to go out by myself. They couldn't keep up with me either so I complained a lot. After a month, we finally went to Turkey and I was relieved to have some freedom and a change of scenery after being cooped up for so long. The resort my grandparents chose was spread out over a large area, but it was heavily secured and isolated from the rest of the city. There was even a guard on the property, making it ideal for jogging. I finally had my own room separate from my grandparents, so I took the opportunity to explore the grounds by myself. I would usually go for a run in the mornings, listening to my music on my old iPod and feeling safe because it was a nice hotel with plenty of other tourists around. However, I began to notice a gardener in his late 40s or early 50s who seemed innocuous enough. He always waved or said something in broken English as I passed by him while he worked on the grounds. I didn't pay him much attention at first, but after about 10 days, I started to see him more often. He looked like a shriveled old date from spending too much time in the sun. One morning while I was jogging, he tried to get my attention by waving and yelling at me. I stopped and took out my earphones to hear him better. Since I knew he worked for the hotel, I didn't suspect anything at first. He waved again and motioned for me to come closer. I wasn't sure what he wanted, but I didn't feel entirely comfortable with the situation. I felt confused but decided to approach him thinking he might want to tell me something. He was standing at the beginning of a trail that led deeper into the gardens, holding a rose in his hand and smiling. He gestured towards me and said, Rosa, beautiful Rosa. I noticed he was extending the rose towards me and began to feel a little uneasy about his intentions. However, I didn't want to be rude and thought it might be harmless, so I accepted the flower. He kept waving and gesturing for me to follow him, but I wanted to be on my way without offending him. As he backed away, I noticed he had another flower in his hand and was holding something behind his back. I looked towards a cabin up the trail where I assumed they stored their gardening supplies and realized that something wasn't right. I quickly stepped back, 
unnerved by his movements. He continues to smile and says Rosa again, while moving the hand behind his back. Suddenly, I see he's holding a rag. Without a second thought, I drop the rose he gave me, turn around, and sprint back to the hotel as fast as I can. I don't look back until I'm inside, surrounded by other people. My heart is racing with fear. I keep the incident to myself and spend the rest of the vacation with my grandparents, not wanting to worry them or ruin their holiday. I see the gardener once more on the beach and feel uncomfortable when he looks at me and says, Rosa mockingly. I'm filled with anger but freeze, unable to respond. After this experience, I stop jogging in the gardens and stay close to my grandparents. It's not until long after summer ends and I'm back home that I feel comfortable enough to jog again. Thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and sharing it to support me. The best is yet to come.